Hi there, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's very nice to see you all. So what we're going to do for the next 30 minutes or so is take you through fandoms, audiences, how it is that they're created, what kind of insights you can learn by listening to them, and then ultimately how you can build them out into strategies. As a very, very quick intro, I'm Phil. So I'm VP of Growth at Pulsar, which is an audience intelligence platform which allows you to do exactly that. Listen to audiences, and I brought a couple of friends here with me today as well. Do you want to introduce yourself, guys? Hi, I'm Ben. I'm Director of Strategy at GNET. We're a creative agency based in Los Angeles, California. And I'm Eric. I'm a strategist at GNET. Fantastic. All right. So, as you may have noticed, I'm a Brit. So I'm here temporarily for a couple of days tops, and then we go back again. And you may have seen the UK has been in the headlines a little bit recently. We're trying some new things over there at the moment. This is one of them. So we've got yet another new prime minister. Obviously, we've got to be politically neutral as a company, so I'm not going to go into too much more details. But obviously, her big slogan is getting Britain moving. We're also going to do something new with the economy right now as well. Much to the delight of my Uber driver earlier, who was just looking for recommendations of where he can come on holiday now in the UK, which you guys can obviously come and find us later with a big green booth, and I can give you some advice as well. And sadly, probably made some headlines here as well, we've got a new monarch. So King Charles III obviously taking over the reins as well. And what we're looking for in the UK at the moment is a bit of silver lining. So I was hoping that we could try and do something new here as well, you know, to lift the spirits a little bit. So some of you may have seen this slide before. I can see some nods and some smiles. So this is pretty old. So I kind of presented this oh, maybe six years ago, give or take at this point. And what I'm really hoping is now it's no longer Prince Charles, it's King Charles. We can stop doing this comparison with the Prince of Darkness, Ozzy Osbourne. Because it was all about, at the point, trying to understand that demographics don't really work, socioeconomics don't work, the world has moved on. It's all about how you can look at people's interests, what it is that connects them together. But we've hit a bit of a stumbling block for that one as well, which is why we're trying to do something a little bit new and a little bit different here today as well. And the reason why those interests ultimately aren't as effective is because we've achieved the holy grail, which obviously being here in Silicon Valley, working for a tech company, you've got to talk about scale, right? Scale is fantastic. It gives you your multipliers. It helps you reach phenomenal scale when you think about communities and audiences and the way that you can connect. There's a whole wealth of different platforms out there depending on what it is that you want to do. You could be on Discord, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, Reddit, Twitter, Twitch if you want to start watching something and talk, maybe a bit of YouTube if you can stand the comments. If you watch some more stuff, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, HBO, Disney, there's a whole wealth of things that people can start to connect on. And if you're looking at then that interest lens, that Prince Charles to the Prince of Darkness, Ozzy Osbourne, what you start to do is you've spread yourself too thin. What you've got now is a very bland, generic bulk. You've achieved too much scale to be able to be relevant. And the problem that you've got when you're looking at audiences, and specifically fandoms, is they care so much about the source material. Because it's the thing that makes up their personality. People have emotional connections to the characters, to the heroes, to the stories, to the plots, and to the games. And if you're not able to keep that detail, of really what matters to each fandom, and more importantly, how those fandoms break down, then you start to look a little bit like a blob, this amorphous nothingness. And then you sound insincere to those people that really matter to you, and ultimately to your brands and when you want to do your marketing. And at the heart of the problem is this, that some people that look very, very similar to each other talk about the same topic very differently. It gets super polarized very quickly online. So this idea of interests and trying to land everything in purely interests, we need to move to looking at opinions 
Because if you can land that opinion, this is how you start to be more relevant. You can hold that relevancy and that authenticity at the same time. And if you can do that one, then ultimately your brand positioning, your messaging is going to be far more effective. And if you're more effective, your spending is going to be far more efficient. And obviously living in the world that we do right now, global recession, shaky markets, lots of turnovers and layoffs, ultimately the first budget to go is the marketing budget. So proving that ROI and making your spend as efficient as it can is pretty crucial. Obviously those three things are pretty insane to try and get your head around, which is why I brought some experts with me today to actually start to go through that. So when we were sitting down about a month ago and we were going through this, I gave Ben and Eric the challenge, which is essentially to answer a mini pitch in about 20 odd minutes, give or take. So what they're gonna do is start to look at audiences and fandoms. How can you set up your brand identity? How it is that you can be unique and connect within those audiences? Audience intelligence, how it is that you can then look at the nuance between those two audiences? And the important one, cultural relevance. How is it that you can still hit that scale and make sure that you're making the right bets and working on the right trends? So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Eric and to Ben. Thanks, Phil. And hey, everyone. We're really excited to be here to talk to you guys about fandoms. Uh, before we get started, I guess it's worth just talking a little bit about what are fandoms and why are they important. Well, fandoms are basically a, connection, a collection of communities or people who have a shared interest or passion. And for us, working in the gaming and entertainment space, uh, fandoms are super important because they really drive the global game and entertainment market. We're looking at roughly you know, 3.2 billion gamers worldwide, uh, nearly 200 billion in terms of estimated global revenue from the games market alone. Um, and nine out of 10 of the top grossing entertainment properties, both across gaming and film, feature film, come from established IPs with global franchises. And what that means is that uh, this is an audience that has a huge amount of influence when it comes to their thoughts and opinions. And one example that we love going back to is Sonic the Hedgehog. Some of you may be aware of this particular reference uh, when Paramount first released the first look. Bit of a backlash, had to do something with the teeth, a little bit scary on the character. Um, but what ultimately happened was Paramount uh, listened to the conversation, listened to what was go going on with the fandom, and they were able to course correct and ultimately launch a very successful film. And if you can see some of the key art references for the sequel, I think one of the great lessons they learned was about re uh, respecting the power of the fandom and their uh, perceptions around their favorite brands and IPs. So this is where Pulsar and agencies like us come in. Our job is to help clients really unpack that conversation uh, so that we can identify, you know, what are the challenges, what are some of the opportunities that come with speaking to such a polarized yet engaged audience. And we do that through the various tools that Pulsar offers from a trend tracking perspective uh, to audience measurement and social listening. But the first area we want to start, like Phil mentioned, you know, we're going to tackle things from a couple of different perspectives, from the brand, the audience, and the culture. And at a brand level, what we're talking about really is helping brands uh, discover and position themselves within a crowded market. And you can't really get more crowded than gaming. Gaming is one of the most crowded uh, verticals today. Uh, looking at just the amount of games released on Steam over the last several years, that's just a fraction. Not all games are released on that platform. So Knowing that there is such a wide number of titles being released yearly, it's become more and more important for brands to be able to di differentiate themselves and stand out. And especially if you are trying to break into games, breaking into a specific segment like a first-person shooter, for example, is even harder. Uh, that's one of the most saturated and one of the most popular genres in gaming today. Um, but what we found through our partnership with Pulsar is that through social listening, you can really tease apart the fundamental elements that fans are talking about so that you can align on what really matters most to your particular audience and build your brand from there. So for example, we listened to conversation around several of the biggest first-person shooter games in the market today. You may or may not recognize some of these titles, titles like Valorant, Overwatch, Call of Duty, Apex Legends. And what we found after analyzing their conversation and specific keywords that popped to the top most often was that there are a couple of topics that they care about the most. One of which is creative and competitive gameplay. The other is around fairness and transparency. 
And then the third is around the characters and the world building that come with that brand. So the question for us becomes, how can you turn these audience insights pulled from the social listening into creative strategies? How might you message against some of these points to an audience that's obviously craving uh, content in these spaces? So with that, Eric will take you through how some of that works as you go through the platform. Thank you, Ben. Clicker? Thank you. All right. So how we identified the desire for creative and competitive gameplay is that we looked at topics um, within the fandom of these games and we started to see you know, terms that indicated uh, the desire for this element. So multiplayer, ranked matchmaking, terms like tactical and creative all kind of point to that direction. Um, and you can see on the creative on the right by Valorant um, how they highlight their gameplay and their messaging to kind of sell this creative and competitive uh, aspect of the game. Next we have fairness and transparency. And I don't know if we have any gamers in here, but um, if there's one thing gamers hate the most, it's cheaters, lag, and bugs. Um, and those things are issues that are kind of rooted in just competitive gameplay because they disrupt how the game works and players don't really have control over it. So a neat way Valorant has approached that is they created something called dev series. And dev series are basically a behind the scenes, um, uh, what would you call it, behind the scenes vlog of where the dev can create what they're, uh, you know, tell their community what they're working on and what's next, next for them to improve on the game. Lastly, we have characters and world building. So if you want people to care about your game, if you want people to connect to the world and characters within your game, you're gonna need to create content that you know, would support that claim. Um, Valorant has invested heavily into this, where they've created character trailers for, I think, 20 different agents. They create cinematics, beautiful cinematics, um, for their in-game uh, in world. So, basically, analyzing the conversation around, <clears throat> around you, you can help identify what matters most to your potential audience and help you uh, position yourself in the market. And speaking of audiences, this is sort of the second territory that will show how you can use Pulsar to attack. Um, what we're really interested in is uncovering nuance within online communities. And that's especially important to us because coming from the gaming and entertainment space, we are well aware of the types of perceptions that gamers and fans have in general. Um, this is, of course, you know, a dated concept, but I think it's rooted in this notion that you know, over time, uh, people's interests have changed, and things that were formerly niche, um, or only belong to a few people, are truly becoming mainstream. Um, so it's become important to really be able to differentiate and find nuance within a generalization. And for instance, we're going to look, take a look at the fantasy landscape. I think this is one that's enjoyed a bit of a renaissance lately. And as you can see from a series ranging from The Witcher to Game of Thrones to Shadow and Bone and Fate, the Wink Saga, um, you can quickly start to see that just labeling fans of these shows as fantasy fans quickly becomes meaningless. Because how is that meant to encompass such a broad variety of content and different types of content? So what we decided to do was take a look at two of the leading fantasy uh, titles right now. Um, you guys are probably aware of them, House of the Dragon and Rings of Power. And we were very curious about how fans of these two different titles differ from each other, and what are some ways that creatively you could tune your messaging that can be more relevant for that specific audience. So when we worked within the platform, looking at House of the Dragon, looking at some of these segments, a couple of interesting things pulled out right away. We can start to see an audience that's a lot more engaged in pop culture, in mainstream media, I uh, think watching shows like Euphoria and TMZ and tuning into Barstool. Um, influencers that are also kind of in that pop cultural space and music that's kind of more tuned towards pop and hip hop. Uh, platform wise, looking at a lot of popular ones that are focused on short form media that encourages sharing. And when we took a look at that and compared that against some of 
the content that we're seeing that uh, HBO has put out in terms of marketing, you can start to see that uh, some of the content starts to map to some of these tonalities and affinities based off of the audiences that we've pulled. So whether that takes the form of a risque TikTok that taps into an audience interest around sex and drama, for example, or something as spectacular and shareable as a 3D billboard in Times Square. Very popular tactic right now, by the way. Um, so what we did was then compare that against the Rings of Power audience, and I think right away we're seeing some pretty sharp differences. So looking at it, we see an audience that's more tuned into media and content that encourages exploration and discovery. Uh, influencers that kind of shape that same sort of territory, Neil Gaiman, Nathan Fillion, classic geek icon. Um, and then music that leans a little bit more towards rock than pop or hip hop. We were especially interested in some of the platforms that show up, um, especially in Discord and Reddit. These are very fan heavy uh, platforms that really encourage theory crafting and debating and a lot of that deeper engagement and conversation that these fandoms enjoy. And when you look at some of the creative, again, that matches to Rings of Power, you can see a little bit of this in action, whether that's in the form of key art that doesn't show any faces, but instead requires you to hone in on the details. It requires the audience to pull a lot more from their knowledge of the brand to get more out of the creative. What does that ring mean? What does that insignia mean? What does that piece of armor mean? What does that weapon mean? And that audience is gonna be able to get a lot more from that and infer what the series or characters are going to be. Um, another cool example we saw was an integration with Alexa, where they had famous chef Marcus Samuelson kind of read and direct um, how you can create recipes inspired by Middle Earth. So these types of tactics that are really about immersion, about transporting you to another place and sensing a brand in a different way, we see all of those as strategies that we think are just totally in line with the type of audience that we're seeing based off of the segmentation within Pulsar. So again, a final look, two audiences, one genre, but very different personas in terms of who they are, what types of media they consume, and what types of creative or content they can likely uh, re relate to the most. And then finally, our last section is around the culture. And this is really about helping our clients be able to identify trends that will be able to break through to certain fans. So before we get into it, this next trend that we are going to be talking about is one that connects Taco Bell, the state of Oregon, Acura, and the US Army. Do you know, anyone know what those things have in common? They've all released anime-focused uh, campaigns within the last year. Uh, all, of course, in an attempt to reach a demographic, certainly. Um, but well, I think one thing that's worth mentioning that that definitely illustrates is how mainstream anime has become as a culture. Not only from a PR perspective and the amount of uh, shows being released, to the number of mentions for anime over the last 10 years. Um, a lot of that can be driven by a couple of different things. I think the pandemic certainly accelerated that in terms of in allowing people to access maybe forms of entertainment they might have not been uh, used to before. Uh, it certainly also brings a sense of nostalgia, anime as a genre. But I think the definition or the example I like the most is because we've all grown up and these are all things, whether it's gaming, comics, fantasy, sci-fi, these are all things that we grow up, we grew up getting bullied for in the 80s and 90s. And I think as the proliferation of social media became a thing, people started to realize they're not alone. And these, these, these interests are a lot more widespread than they would originally have to believe. So with that in mind, and uh, along with the work that we've done at GNET, you know, analyzing varieties of communities across various gaming and entertainment brands, we do see significant segments or sub-segments of anime fans that exist across a variety of properties. And their presence can really drive some real-world impact. And an example of that for us is Cyberpunk 2077. This was a game that was released a couple of years ago and has recently gotten a little bit of a resurgence uh, because of a Netflix anime that was also released in September. And as you can see from a couple of the charts, uh, they match the, the release of the anime has definitely driven not only an increase in the amount of concurrent players that have been playing the game since the release of that series, but also a huge spike in the number of mentions as well as positive sentiment around the game. So you can see the halo effect that having these transmedia strategies can impart on a brand. And it is worth mentioning that, you know, 
this type of strategy is scalable. Not everyone has the budget to release a Netflix animated show. That would be nice. Um, but in addition to do, going that route, we've had uh, clients and partners do things like in-game partnerships, something that Fortnite has had a huge amount of success with recently in terms of bringing several famous IPs into their world. Uh, Call of Duty has done the same, PUBG as well. And then finally, you know, thematic content. So that could be as simple as leveraging an in-game event that's themed around it, using talent, using aesthetics, using music from that particular cultural standpoint can all be ways to uh, infuse that into your creative and to be on top of that trend. So that's it for us. A couple of key takeaways just in terms of fandoms. You know, they are high risk, high reward audiences, but they do drive and fuel some of the biggest brands in entertainment today. Uh, speaking authentic to them really requires an understanding so that you can dig out the nuances between each audience so that you can speak to them as truthful people instead of just a genre. And then finally, listening can really help reveal some bubbling trends that can uh, sh it result in some shared affinities that can boost real world impact for some of your products. And that's our show today. All right, you guys open for a couple of questions? Sure, yeah, sure. All right, let's, because I, I saw Castlevania, whoo, check. And a couple other things. So I'm definitely one of those uh, late bloomer gamers. And I do see a lot of the crossover that's going over. And, you know, I'm not saying I was a nerd and I used to get chased to the bathroom. <laughs> not saying any of that. But I'm glad that it has definitely become more mainstream. Um, I guess my question would be, you know, as a, as a business, you know, not having the huge budgets like you said, you know, how would we interact with this type of data? Well, how can we leverage this? Uh, for our business. Yeah, like I said, you know, there are there are kind of heavier lift ways into tapping into some of these strategies. Obviously, the Netflix show is a is a pretty significant one. But you know, tapping into I think influencers are a great territory. Using influencers that are well known within these specific communities. Um, using voice talent, amount of voice actors that have huge lift uh, or huge impact among gaming audiences is also huge. Um, so I think there are a lot of ways in that you can tackle it creatively without necessarily having to break the bank budget wise absolutely uh, and it, it, it just hit me when you said influences because that would actually be an incredible way uh, let's open it up any questions beautiful I have two I'm gonna go with you first name and company please thanks so much I'm Melanie Maharshand I'm with WTW uh, sure Melanie Maharshand I'm with WTW and I'm just curious are the networks of fans that you're connecting with, are they existing networks? And are other product groups using them, like say the Tesla owners groups, are they lurking on the chat groups and the forums and looking for, we're just looking for organic feedback? Is that how you're getting your feedback from these groups? Yeah, I'll tell them if you want. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's both sides of the stick is the honest answer. So you've obviously got existing fan groups that exist all over the internet and all over you know, magazines and print and broadcast as well. It doesn't just have to be the world of social anymore these days. But then you can also go top down and try and work out what it is from a category perspective. Look at those keywords, look at those trigger words that it is that you think the fandoms are gonna be interested in, that you wanna build your hypothesis around, and then you can go and prove it. And you can do both ways and have a look at what's got the largest addressable audience that it is that you can possibly get. Okay. I have another question. Hi, my name is Amanda. I'm with P2S uh, Inc. And I just want to know, was there an age difference when you did that study between, uh, what was it, the House of Dragon and the Ring of Power? So the ages were actually pretty much the same, 18 to 24, just hugely different uh, interests and uh, media affinities, basically. Um, when we looked at those two audiences, well, we, we didn't look at them just compared to the general public. What we did was compare them to each other, just to really see how they were unique compared to each other. Hi, 
Hi, um, my name is Shelby. I'm with Sony PlayStation. Um, so social listening is something that we struggle with. Um, and I was curious, do you guys and your companies, like when you did these studies, do you build um, unique models that are tailored to the different games and titles that you're working on? Or is it kind of one out of the box social listening tool that you use? It's a pretty custom process that we go through, especially when it comes to identifying a specific segment. We try not to rely on too, gen too broad generalizations, but things that we'll do, like we'll create proxy audiences if it's a new title, for example, that we don't have a specific reference for. Um, but yeah, I think generally it depends on the scope of, of, the, of the challenge, but it's usually a custom solution. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes? No? All right. Well, let's give these gentlemen a great round of applause. Nice, very.